And so we begin again. This uh, next bit is going to be on uh, several important theorems, really three important theorems, maybe four depending on your count, um, from chapter 9. To begin with the Cauchy integral formula, so let's get to it. Then I'll prove the generalized Cauchy integral formula, um, Marrero's theorem, and finally Gorsau's theorem. All right. So the Cauchy integral formula um, starts with the assumption you know, we've got a function which is complex differentiable on some open connected set. Let's get to the statement of it. Here we go. Let D be. It also is important that it's a bounded domain. All right. So let D be a bounded domain with piecewise smooth boundary. All right. FF is holomorphic. And what? Continuous with continuous f prime of z and d, and f and its derivative f prime of z extend to the boundary of d. Then for each z and d, we have uh, here's the punchline. The f of z is equal to the one over two pi i times the integral of f of w over w minus z dw. All right. It's a very kind of strange formula when you first look at it. It says a function is equal to its integral in some sense, but it's not the function itself, right? It's the function divided by w minus z. So that's part of the catch. All right. So, maybe, oh, I forgot to get my picture. I spent I spent far too long on this picture. So here's a picture. <laughs> this picture intends to uh, help explain the sets I'm going to use in this theorem. So D, it's the whole set, which includes Z. All right, here's Z. All right. Then we are encircling Z with this little circle of radius epsilon, plus for counterclockwise. All right. Gamma. And then, of course, um, you know, D could have a hole in it. It doesn't really matter. But the point is, the set, the point Z is fixed, all right? And despite the wording of my proof, there is no logical reason that D itself cannot have holes. The proof requires that we punch one more as to create a set S on which we can apply Cauchy's theorem. Um, and, um, Let's see here. Cauchy's theorem was the one that says that the integral of a um, can, uh, the integral of a holomorphic function um, over the boundary of some region is, is zero bounded region. And so S is everything except for the circles. Not oh man, I was trying not to shade that circle in. Look, it somehow. Well, I can't tell if it's actually. I'm gonna shut up. Let's go on. All right. So assume the preconditions of the theorem. Fix the point Z and D. Notice D is open. Z is interior, thus we're free, free to choose, um, you know, a disk of radius epsilon. All right. And the boundary consists of D epsilon, consists of the, um, oh, excuse me, D epsilon, actually. Oh, man, I got, I'm sorry, I, I said S over there in the other picture, but I, I guess I meant D epsilon, didn't I? I called that S in the other picture, my apology. All right. And, um, so D epsilon has two boundaries, the boundary of D and uh, the, the circle, all right? Furthermore, you can observe that G of W, which is F of W over W minus Z, is holomorphic, right? Because we assumed what? We assumed that F was holomorphic, right, on D. So F of W doesn't get into trouble. And W minus Z is only zero when W equals to Z. So if we avoid the point Z, then this is actually holomorphic, right? And you can differentiate it because we assume the derivative, the complex derivative of F of Z exists. So we get G prime of W is F prime of W over W minus Z minus F of W over W minus Z squared. This is the, uh, you know, we got a quotient rule or a product rule, if you like, however you want to look at it. And so G prime of W is continuous on 
on my S or D epsilon if you like. Um, and you can check, of course, that G of W and G prime of W both extend, con extend continuously to the boundary because we assumed from the outset that the same is true for F of W and F prime of W. So applying Cauchy's theorem, which we proved last time, we get that the integral of this, this, G, this G function, F of W over W minus Z is zero. But that means that we got two things going on. We got the integral around the boundary of D, which is what we're after, and plus the integral around this little circle, counterclockwise oriented, excuse me, clockwise oriented at the moment, of F of W over W minus Z is equal to zero. But of course we can bring that to the other side and put a minus. Um, and um, so on the other hand, anyway, long story short, if you move it, move it to the other side, you can absorb the minus into switching the orientation of the integral around the circle, right? And so you got the integral of the boundary of D of this function is equal to the integral around this little circle, radius epsilon centered at Z, like that, right? But you remember that handy dandy mean value property, right? So let's see how that comes into play here. Um, circle gamma epsilon plus has W equal to, there's a parameterization of the circle, right? And um, there's your range of the parameter. And dz is exactly i epsilon e to the i theta d theta. So we can actually calculate this thing, right? And w minus c is just epsilon e to the i theta naught. And then so that and that cancel, as does that radius and that radius. The radius epsilon cancels the radius epsilon. leaves us an i. We can pull out that 2 pi i and divide by 2 pi for good measure. But then this, 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 this right here, hey, we've seen this before, right? And that is the average value of f, right? And f is holomorphic, f is holomorphic and hence harmonic, right? So it certainly has the mean value property. Um, and bam, there you go. 2 pi i f of z, and then just divide by 2 pi i, and uh, that, uh, that gets it for you, right? And so that's uh, that's Cauchy's integral formula, which is uh, you know kind of neat. And also, you see why it was uh, bad for me to uh, skip the mean value property. <laughs> so sorry. Um, now something really neat happens if you're willing to do some crazy calculations with me here. If we have the if we have the the um, Cauchy's integral formula, which I'll, I mean, I'll write again here. So what was that? It was f of z it was, what was it? 1 over 2 pi i, integral over the boundary of d, right? f of w over w minus z dw, right? And if you're willing to, to do some kind of fun stuff here, just take this blue formula I just wrote down and differentiate it, right? with respect to z, well, you know, pull the 2 pi i out front, fine. But if, you, uh, sw if you're willing, be so bold as to switch the order of the integration and the differentiation, right? If you do that, and you might ask, well, why can't I do that? Well, good question. But you can. And, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, when you do, you get that. All right, so we found out that the uh, derivative of f of z is equal to 1 over 2 pi i. I wrote, rewrote the 1 as a 1 factorial for reasons that are just silly at this point. Um, f of w over w minus z squared. Well, that's kind of neat. Having done that once, we can't help but do it again. Ooh, about to knock my glass on the floor. That would be good. So do it again formally differentiate that formula we just found and we get that switching the order of integration and differentiation again right and um, when you differentiate this with respect to uh, z the w stuff just rides along and you just differentiate the you know basically the denominator to the minus three power well it was the minus two power right and um but there's also it's w minus z so that minus from the chain rule compensates the minus with the negative power to leave you a positive thing. 
anyway, what you got is 2 factorial over 2 pi i integral of f of w over w minus z cubed. You start to see a pattern here. And you can continue this. And you can prove this with, with, a, with an induction if you're willing to just assume the switch of integration and differentiation, which again is something we really ought to prove in a deeper analysis course. Um, uh, anyway, so here we go, f of m, the mth derivative at z is actually going to be m factorial over 2 pi i integral over the boundary of d, f of w over w minus z to the m plus 1 dw. This is the, uh, the value of the mth derivative of f at z, given by integrals of the function divided by w minus the, that point to the m plus 1th power. A fantastically bizarre formula, really. Um, I, you know, I, you know, I don't think there is any real analog to this, to my knowledge. I mean, it's just it's just a really, really strange formula, but um, important. This is Cauchy's generalized integral formula. All right, and uh, I have a proof here, which you can take or leave. Um, you know, I think this is from Churchill. I, I have, and it essentially shows that. Um, the formal differentiation thing I just did actually works out and actually makes sense, but um, you know uh, that's that's okay. Um, now, so let's see here. I don't know maybe it's a four hundred level course I'd make you prove it or something I don't know, but. Um, Anyway, there's the Cauchy's generalized integral formula stated in all of its glory, and oftentimes it's useful to uh, solve for the integral because this actually, you know, you can turn it on its, uh, turn it, kind of turn it over, and this is actually the thing I just boxed, and we'll again box in red, is actually a uh, a tool for you to use to do integrals, right? This says that. See, because often it's much easier to differentiate a function than it is to actually integrate it, right? Um, although it's not the function, right? There's a trade-off. It's the function divided by z minus z naught to some power, right? And I'm saying that instead you could um, differentiate the function m full times, divide, evaluate, evaluate z naught, divide by n factorial, multiply by 2 pi i, and that would give you the value of that integral. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, here's a simple example. If we uh, integrate sine of z over z minus i to the sixth power, then direct application of um, Cauchy's integral formula with, in this case, my m is equal to five because six plus one, uh, five plus one is six. So we have two pi, five, two pi i over five factorial, the fifth derivative um, of sine of two z evaluated at z equals to i. And so that's a pretty easy five derivatives to do, right? It picks up a minus 32 cosine 2i. And so there you go. Minus 8 pi i cosh of 2 divided by 15 is the value of that integral. Um, I think we can all agree that this is easier than direct computation of that. Okay, yeah. You're like, yeah. Okay. How do I know which one to use? Well, the answer should become obvious to you as you apply Cauchy's Integral Theorem a couple times. All right. Uh, now, there are nonlinear applications in the sense of not, not logically linear applications of Cauchy's Integral Theorem as well. We'll see some of those. Here's another example. If we look at the um, equation z to the fourth plus i equals to zero, well, there are four solutions here that are pictured. Bop, 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 bop. These are the places, the four places, where if you've got a denominator formed by z to the fourth plus i, you get into trouble. Right? And so z to the fourth plus i factors as z minus that times z minus that times z minus that, well, I mean plus that, z plus that, which is just to say that it's the factorization which is based on these four zeros. All right? And if we consider the circle centered at one, radius 1 in blue, which I will now add the blueness. There you go. Thinking of something blue. Something blue. Right. And um, so there you go. 
call that circle, you know, it stays out of trouble with these three soon to be green points, right? This guy is fine, es bueno, es bueno, no problem. But then this guy, this guy right here, he's a troublemaker. He's inside the curve, right? So if I go to apply, um, well, that's the thing, is I can apply uh, um, Cauchy's integral formula based on that one divergent point, yeah? And so let's do that. So, to integrate over that circle, the blue circle, uh, dz over z to the fourth plus i, that's to say integrate this function, right? And, ah, lost track of which one was which troublemaker. E to, the min e to the minus i pi over 8, e to the minus i pi over 8 was the troublemaker. E to the minus pi i over 8. So we're looking for e to the minus. So this, this one, this one blows up. This one blows up inside the circle, right? Well, there I made it a disk, right? Um, so, but other than that, right, other than that point, other than that point, the remaining part of the function, the reciprocal, that times that times that is holomorphic, right? This is fine everywhere. It's just that that's the troublemaker. So what I think of is I think of the this 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 whole not the two pi i but the denominator here. I think of all the one over all of this as being the f. Um, you know that's the f of z, all right? As 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 discussed in Cauchy's integral formula or generalized. Uh, well, yeah, just Cauchy's integral formula here. And so what I have to do is I have to take that. Multiply by two pi and evaluate at the bad point. That's what the theorem says. And so I do that, and it works out to this. All right. So again, just to, to circle back, the the formula, the formula says f of z is equal to one over two pi i f of w over w minus e dw. Right. Notice that f of z has to be holomorphic with continuous derivative on d, um, but and that's the case, right? F of z. The thing is, the the, the trouble thing is the um, that that particular point. Uh, I'm losing words, losing words. Ah, goodness gracious! I'm not careful. to knock that drink right off this table. All right. So I'm trying to I'm trying to get across here. I'm not sure if I'm doing it or not. Is this that my f of z is one over? Let me call this whole thing star one over that 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 stuff, right? And that 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 expression is fine in the whole disk of radius one centered at one. The original divergence is completely accounted for in this factor. Everything else is fine. All right. Anyway. And finally, one last point. And that's this. Is that if f of z is holomorphic, right? And it has continuous derivative f prime of z. All right? Then, if you look at what we just wrote down, that means that f of z is com infinitely complex differentiable because f prime and f prime prime and so forth and so on all exist and are continuous on d. And that follows from the, you know, the generalized, this, this guy right here, right? This says that the nth derivative uh, of z is given by this formula. So if I'm, and, and I'm, if I'm assuming that the conditions are met for f, namely that f is holomorphic with continuous derivative, then it follows that we cannot differentiate. We can differentiate not just once, but m fold times. In other words, you can't have a function which is just once complex differentiable, meeting those conditions. If it's once complex differentiable, it's infinitely many times complex differentiable. This is in stark contrast to the real theory. Leibel's theorem we'll talk about tomorrow, most likely. 
So that brings us to Marrero's theorem, which I'll start again here in a minute. 